Now, clearly what happens in nature to iron-rich silicate minerals like olivine and pyroxene is a little more complex than what happens to a nail in a bowl of water. First of all, the nail is simply pure iron. In the case of the iron silicate, there's not just iron there, there's also silica, the oxygen silica tetrahedra, you remember. And while the iron oxidizes and goes to form an iron rust, limonite, the oxygen silicon tetrahedra are dissolved in the water. Now, not only is the iron silicate different to the nail in nature, but also temperature is important. And we can see that from specimens like this. This is a piece of schist, a schist rich in iron silicates. It was collected from Georgia, and the weathering product on the surface, the iron oxide crust, is very red. It's dominantly the mineral hematite. The soil in areas like this, where one can collect specimens that have weathered hematite red, is often blood red. This is a road cut in Yosemite National Park in California. And like Georgia, the climate is warm, the rainfall is seasonal, and the result is red weathering soil from igneous rocks that are beneath the soil surface. If that rock specimen, if this one here, were in the Sudbury area, then it would weather brown. Brown like the basalt that we looked at first, a rusty, anonymous looking brown. It's the difference in climate which causes the iron mineral to be different. Hematite in warm climates with seasonal rainfall and limonite in the temperate Sudbury area. Now, the other thing which can uh, cause a difference in the color of the mineral uh, that's developed on the weathered surface is the kind of metal which is within the rock. In this specimen, which instead of being an igneous rock with the metals in silicates is an ore specimen, the color is due to the presence of nickel and copper. Clearly then, the kind of weathering color that we get on the surface of rocks and of ore specimens is a good indication to prospectors of just what sort of rock or ore is beneath the surface. Here is a, another specimen of ore, also from the Sudbury area, and we can see, once again, the kind of limonite crust that we would expect to find on an iron-rich ore or rock. And sure enough, that's what we've got. On this freshly broken specimen, we can see that the main mineral is pyrite. Now, pyrite is iron sulfide. So once again, we've got an iron-rich mineral, like an iron silicate. But instead of silica accompanying the iron, in the case of pyrite, we have sulfur accompanying the iron. Let's have a look at the atomic structure of iron sulfide and discuss just what happens to the two components of that mineral. This is an atomic model of iron sulfide, of pyrite. Here are the iron atoms, and it's these atoms which are gobbled up by the oxygen to form the limonite in the Sudbury area. The bonds between the iron atoms and the sulfur atoms, which are these here, and which surround the iron atoms, are broken by the oxygen, which gobbles up the iron. The sulfur atoms are found in then, or then go into combination with water and oxygen to form sulfuric acid. So, just as in the silicates, the process is not just one kind of process, there are two processes, the oxidization of the iron and the combination of the sulfur 
with oxygen and water to form sulfuric acid, a second product that goes away in solution like the silica. We've looked then at the chemical changes that are undergone by the iron-rich silicate minerals. The iron in them is oxidized to limonite or hematite, depending on the climate, and the silica goes into solution. In the iron-rich ores, the sulfides, the iron is also oxidized, the sulfur also goes into solution, as the silica did, but this time forms sulfuric acid. Now, what about one of the other rocks that we looked at at the beginning of the unit? If we look at the granite, we find that the dominant mineral component is feldspar. About 75% of the granite is feldspar. And that feldspar is the starting point for this, for clay. If we were able to look at the feldspar grains in those broken up fragments very close up, with a microscope perhaps, we'd be able to see that the feldspar grains looked rather chalky, a little white. And that is the beginning of the breakdown of the feldspar, the chemical breakdown of the feldspar. Once again, it's dependent on climate somewhat. And we only have to look at Cleopatra's needle in New York to see that. After a few decades, the feldspar is turning to clay, whereas for 35 centuries in Egypt, the feldspar stayed perfectly fresh. So it's also a change that depends on climate. But what is the nature of that change? Well, what is the composition of feldspar? Here we've put up again the composition of potassium feldspar as our example. Potassium, aluminum, and oxygen silicon tetrahedra. If we take a piece of feldspar of that composition and we put it in a jar of water, like the nail was put in a jar of water, with access uh, to the air, what we find is that the potassium totally dissolves. It disappears into the water. Some of the oxygen silicon tetrahedra also dissolve, and water is added. So we end up with a mineral of the composition water, aluminum, and oxygen silicon tetrahedra. And its structure is also radically different from the feldspar that we began with. Its structure consists of layers. We can represent the first of those layers of aluminum and oxygen silicon tetrahedra with this red stripe. I'm sorry, aluminum and water and oxygen silicon tetrahedra in this layer. And a second sandwich of aluminum and water, and then oxygen silicon tetrahedra. That's the structure of the new mineral. And it's not surprising that it's the structure of the new mineral. If you remember from looking at micas, the properties of minerals with a layered structure. The Minerals with a layered structure had plates which slid over one another or cleaved away from one another. In clay, the same thing happens on a microscopic scale. When I press the clay or you pot with clay, what you do is you move layers one over the other. These sandwiches are sliding. And the structure of mica is remarkably similar to the structure of the clay that we've just made. In fact, all we would have to do in order to get to mica is we'd have to add some aluminum, this quartz up here, add a little bit more oxygen silicon, another layer there, and do the same thing down here. some potassium, oxygen silicon tetrahedra, and so on. And there we'd have a mica, we'd have muscovite mica. 
So there seems to be a close relationship in atomic structure and also a quite close relationship in composition between the clay we've just made and the micas.